Today I'm going to read the uh, dissenting opinion of Justice Clarence Thomas on uh, the Supreme Court of the United States number 20-255 Mahanoy Area School District Petitioner v. Uh, B.L. a minor by and through her father Lawrence Levy and her mother Betty Lou Levy on writ of Certiorari Certiorari of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit on uh, June 23rd let me go to the ready room though so Justice Thomas dissenting BL, a high school student, sent a profanity-laced message to hundreds of people, including classmates and teammates. The message included a picture of BL raising her middle finger and captioned, F school and F cheer. This message was juxtaposed with another, which explained that BL was frustrated that she failed to make the varsity cheerleading squad. The cheerle cheerleading coach responded by disciplining BL. The court overrides that decision without even mentioning the 150 years of history supporting the coach using broad brush strokes. The majority outlines the scope of school authority. When students are on campus, the majority says, schools have authority in loco parentis, that is, as substitutes of parents, to discipline speech and conduct. Off campus, the authority of schools is somewhat less. At that level of generality, I agree but the majority emits important detail. What authority does a school have when it operates in loco parentis? How much less authority do schools have over off-campus speech and conduct? And how does a court decide if speech is on or off campus? Disregarding these important issues. The majority simply posits three vague considerations and reaches an outcome. A more searching review reveals that schools historically could discipline students in circumstances like those presented here because the majority does not attempt to explain why we should not apply this historical rule and does not attempt to tether its approach to anything stable, I respectfully dissent. Well, the majority... Uh, let's see, 1A. While the majority entirely ignores the relevant history, I would begin the assessment of the scope of free speech rights incorporated against the states by looking to what ordinary citizens at the time of the 14th Amendment's ratification would have understood uh, the right to encompass. McDonald v. Chicago, um, 561 U.S., 742, comma, 813 from uh, 2010, Thomas J. concurring in part and concurring in judgment. Cases and treatises from that era reveal that public schools retained substantial authority to discipline students. As I have previously explained, that authority was near plenary when students were at school. See Morris v. Frederick, 551 U.S. 393 comma 419 from 2007 also a concurring opinion authority also extended to when students were traveling to or from school and that's another reference oh, am i going to do all of these ceg lander v siever 32 vt 114 120 from 1859 and although schools have less authority after a student returned home it was well settled that they still could discipline students for off-campus speech or conduct that had a proximate tendency to harm the school environment. Perhaps the most familiar example applying this rule is the case where a student, after returning home from school, used disrespectful language against the teacher. He called the teacher old in presence of the teacher or some of his fellow pupils. The Vermont Supreme Court held that the teacher could discipline a student for this speech because the speech had a direct and immediate tendency to injure the school, to subvert the master's authority, and to beget disorder and insubordination. The court distinguished the speech at issue from speech, quote, in no ways connected with or affecting the school, and speech that has, quote, merely a remote and indirect tendency to injure.
in requiring a direct and immediate tendency to harm, the court used the language of proximate causation. See Black's Law, Black's Law Dictionary 274, 11th edition from 2019, defining proximate cause as a cause to directly produce an event. This rule was widespread. It was consistent with the universal custom in New England. Universal qu custom in quotes. Lander, 32 BT at 121 various cases, treatise, treatises, and school manuals endorsed it. And a justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court presiding over a trial declared the rule well settled. T. Stockwell, the school manual containing the school laws of Rhode Island, 236 to 238, 1882. So widespread was this rule that it served not only as the basis for schools to discipline disrespectful speech, but also to regulate truancy. Although modern doctrine draws a clear line between speech and conduct, cases in the 19th century did not. Lots of references here. I'm not going to read all of these. Citing Lander, schools justified regulating truancy because of its proximate tendency to harm schools. As a Missouri Supreme Court put it, although, quote, truancy is an act committed out of the school, schools could regulate it because of its, quote, subversive effects on the, quote, good order and discipline of the school. Some courts made statements that, if read in isolation, could suggest that schools had no authority at all to regulate off-campus speech. And there's another opinion there. Uh, but these courts made it clear that the rule against regulating off-campus speech applied only when that speech was, quote, no wise connected with the management or successful operation of the school. In other words, they followed Lander. A school can regulate speech when it occurs off campus so long as it has a proximate tendency to harm the school, its faculty, or students, or its programs. B. If there is a good constitutional reason to depart from this historical rule, the majority and parties fail to identify it. It would thus uh, apply the rule. I would thus apply the rule. Uh, assuming that BL speech occurred off campus, the purpose and effect of BL speech was to quote degrade the program of cheerleading, uh, the program and cheerleading staff in front of other pupils, thus having a direct and immediate tendency to subvert the cheerleading coach's authority. As a result, the coach had authority to discipline BL. Our modern doctrine is not to the contrary. The penalties imposed in this case were unrelated to any political viewpoint or religious viewpoint. And although the majority sugarcoats the speech as criticism, ante, it, at, at eight, it is well settled that schools can punish vulgar speech, at least when it occurs on campus. The discipline here a one-year suspension from the team may strike some as disproportionate. But that does not matter for our purposes. State courts have policed school disciplinary decisions for, quote, reasonableness. And, uh, for example, Burdick, 31 Iowa, at 565. And disproportionate discipline can be challenged by parents in the political process from Morris 551 U.S. at 420. Thomas J. concurring. But the majority and the parties provide no textual or historical evidence to suggest that federal courts generally can police the proportionality of school disciplinary decisions in the name of the First Amendment. Two, the majority declines to consider any of this history, instead favoring a few pragmatic guideposts. This is not the first time the court has chosen intuition over history when it comes to student speech. The larger problem facing us today is that our student speech cases are untethered from any textual or historical foundation. That failure leads the majority to miss much of the analysis relevant to these kinds of cases. Consider the court's uh, A. Consider the court's longtime failure to grapple with the historical doctrine of in loco parentis. As I have previously explained, the four 14th Amendment was ratified against the background legal principle that publicly funded schools operated not as ordinary state actors, but as delegated substitutes of parents. This 
principle freed schools from the constraints of the 14th Amendment placed on other government actors. Quote, no one doubted the government's ability to educate and discipline children as private schools did, including through strict discipline for behavior the school considered disrespectful or wrong. The doctrine of in loco parentis limited the ability of schools to set rules and control their classrooms in almost no way. Plausible arguments can be raised in favor of departing from the historical doctrine. When the 14th Amendment was ratified, just three jurisdictions had compulsory education laws. MCAT's History of Compulsory Education Laws, 17 from 1976. One might agree that the delegation logic of in loco parentis applies only when delegation is voluntary, but... Um, at 11 through 13, identifying analogs to compulsory education laws as clearly as the 1640s. Pierce v. Society of Sisters, 268 U.S. 510 from 1925, requiring states to permit parents to send their children to non-public schools. The court, however, did not make that or any other argument against this historical doctrine. Instead, the court simply abandoned the foundational rule without mentioning it. C. Tinker v. Des Moines, Independent Community School District, 393 U.S. 503 from 1969. Rather than wrestle with this history, the court declared that it had the unmistakable holding of this court for almost 50 years that students have free speech rights inside schools. But the cases the court cited in favor of that bold proposition do not support it. The cases on which Tinker chiefly relied concerned the rights of parents and private schools, not students. 551 U.S. at 420 and 8 of the 11 cases the court cited, only one, West Virginia BD, uh, Board of Education versus Barnett, 319 U.S. 624 from 1943, was on point. But, like Tinker, Barnett failed to mention the historical doctrine undergirding school authority. Not, on, uh, not until decades later did the court even hint at this doctrine, and then only as an aside, see Fraser, 478 U.S. at 684. The majority does not uh, know better today. At least it acknowledges that schools act in loco parentis when, student, uh, when students speak on campus, see e.g. ante, uh, at 5. But the majority fails to address the historical contours of that doctrine, whether the doctrine applies to off-campus speech or why the court has abandoned it. B. The court's failure to explain itself in Tinker needlessly makes the case more, this case more difficult. Unlike Tinker, which involved a school's authority under the, a straightforward fact pattern, this case involves speech made in one location but capable of being received in countless others, an issue that has been aggravated exponentially by recent technological advances. The court's decision not to create a solid foundation in Tinker and now here not to consult the relevant history predictably causes the majority to ignore relevant analysis. First, the majority gives little apparent significance to BL's decision to participate in an extracurricular activity, but the historical text suggests that authority of schools over off-campus speech may be greater when students participate in extracurricular programs. The Lander test focuses on the effect of speech, not its location, so students like BL, who are active in extracurricular programs, have a greater potential by virtue of their participation to harm those programs. For example, a profanity-laced screed delivered on social media or at the mall has a much different effect on a football program when done by a regular student than, by, uh, than when done by the captain of the football team. So too here. Second, the majority fails to consider whether schools often will have more authority, not less, to discipline students who transmit speech through social media because off-campus speech made through social media can be received on campus and can sp uh, spread rapidly to countless people. It often will have a greater proximate tendency to harm the school environment than will an off-campus in-person conversation. Third, and relatedly, the majority uncritically adopts the assumption that BL's speech in fact was off campus, but the location of her speech is a much trickier question than the majority acknowledges. Because speech travels, schools sometimes may be able to treat speech as on campus even though it originates off campus. 
Nobody doubts, for example, that a school has in loco parentis authority over a student and can discipline him when he passes out vulgar flyers on campus, even if he creates those flyers off campus. The same may be true for many contexts which uh, social media speech is generated off campus but received on campus. To be sure, this logic might not apply where the on-campus presence of speech is not proximately connected to its off-campus origin, as when a student wholly accidentally brings a sibling sketch to, sc uh, to school years after it is created, like in Porter v. Ascension Parish School Board uh, 393F uh, 3D 608, 615, 617 through 18. This break in private proximate causation might occur more often when a school prohibits the use of personal devices on social media on campus, or social media on campus. But where it is foreseeable and likely that speech will travel onto campus, the school has a stronger claim to treating the speech as on-campus speech. Here, it makes sense to treat BL speech as off-campus speech. There is little evidence that BL speech was received on campus. The cheerleading coach, in fact, did not view BL's speech. She viewed a copy of that speech, a screenshot created by another student, Ante at two. But the majority mentions none of this. It simply and uncritically assumes that BL's speech was off campus. Because it creates a test untethered from history, it bypasses this relevant inquiry. The court transparently makes a common law approach to today's decision. In effect, it states just one rule. Schools can regulate speech less often when the speech occurs off campus. It then identifies this case as an example and leaves for future cases the job of developing this new common law doctrine, anti at seven, dash, uh, seven through eight. But the court, uh, the court's foundation is untethered from anything stable and courts and schools will almost certainly be at a loss as to what exactly the court's opinion today means. Perhaps there is a good const uh, there are good constitutional reasons to depart from this uh, historical rule, or to depart from the historical rule. And perhaps this court and lower courts will identify and explain these reasons in the future. But because the court does not do so today, and because it reaches the wrong result under the appropriate historical test, I respectfully dissent.